hi everybody. This is the brain model portion of the brain lab for Biology 168. The first structures that we're going to begin to look at are on the lateral view of the brain model and we're going to start with the cerebrum and then move through the different lobes. Okay, this is the cerebrum. This whole part here is the cerebrum and it is characterized by the presence of these gyri, these convexities that make these little patterns on the brain. And those are delineated by these indentions called sulci. So the gyri are the parts that stick out, the sulci are the ones that fold in. And this creates more surface area over the brain. So we can look at this, all of this is the cerebrum. This is the seat of higher intelligence, really. And we can divide it into several lobes each of which with specific functions. Before we look at each of the individual lobes, it's helpful to define some landmarks. So one of the major landmarks we're gonna see separates left and right hemispheres. So that would be the longitudinal fissure. And if you stick your fingers in there, yes, indeed, it is a fissure. And it separates the two hemispheres of the cerebrum. And then we have the transverse cerebral fissure, which is going to separate the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Then we can start to look at individual lobes. Before we do that, one more major landmark. We have the central sulcus, and that is this large sulcus that pretty much divides the brain into front and posterior, I should say anterior and posterior parts. We also have the lateral sulcus right here, which is going to delineate this part here, which is going to be our temporal lobe not surprisingly that it is right under the temporal bone. Then we are going to have our frontal lobe that's going to be anterior to the central sulcus. Not surprisingly, it's under the frontal bone. Then if we look posterior to the central sulcus, we will see the parietal lobes on either side. And this is mostly colored in purple here. So this purple lavendery stuff is the parietal lobes. Those will kind of bleed over into the occipital lobe, which is behind, or I should say, deep to the occipital bone. And basically it's kind of a very nondescript border as you move from the parietal lobe to the occipital lobe, but we're basically counting all of this as the occipital lobe. And then we have one other sulcus that we can define, the parieto-occipital sulcus, which on the exterior part of the brain is really quite difficult to discern. And really it's basically just a connect the dots kind of thing from one sulcus to another that sort of traces the outside of this. It's going to vary widely on human beings and you're going to see individually a lot of variation. So you can also look at it in here, the parieto occipital sulcus, which is really separating the parietal or the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. Um, let's see what else. We have the cerebellum, cerebellum. and the pons and medulla. All right, if we're going to look below, we see that. We've seen the cerebellum before, and we see on this model, it's kind of this green color with these folia, or these folds here. Now, if we look underneath, we will see the pons, which has these nice transverse fibers running across it. And pons means bridge, by the way, so you can think of it as a bridge. And we'll study this a little bit later when we get to lecture, but this big bulge here has these transverse fibers arising from the cerebellum, and they are you know, this bulge here, and then what's below it is the medulla oblongata. That would be this part here. And you really can't see much of the spinal cord at all, but the spinal cord would extend from here on out. All right. Then we have the primary motor cortex and the primary sensory cortex. So the primary motor cortex is in this gyrus right in front of the central sulcus, and we call this the precentral gyrus, and this is motor cortex, and this is where all your commands to your skeletal muscles arise from. Then we have our sensory cortex, or our sensory, uh, somatosensory cortex, which is right here. It's this purple stuff, the darker purple, and it is right behind, or posterior to, the central sulcus, and we call this, not surprisingly, the postcentral gyrus. Then we have the primary visual cortex and the primary auditory cortex. The primary visual cortex is this green stuff right here. Yes, and it's and on I, the occipital lobe. It's on the occipital pole back here. I believe the model says input. 
in visual input? Yeah, it says visual input here. And this is where most of your raw visual information is coming into. And then you'll have visual association areas in yellow, which is where you're doing additional processing on that raw visual in information. And you're doing additional processing and basically figuring out additional features of visual information. So the primary auditory cortex is going to be right in a little area called Heschel's gyrus and around this area and slightly inside too. If you were able to retract this uh, temporal lobe, you could see some of it's on the inside, some of it's right along here. And as you spread out, you'll have more incorporated association areas. You can have it on both sides. You have it over here too. So primary, primary auditory cortex will be right about here. And then you'll have association areas that cover a larger extent of the temporal lobe. We also have two very important areas. Um, one auditory area that really covers this area right around here. Uh, they call it sensory speech here, but there's a term of Fernicke's area because of the anatomist who discovered it and you'll see all kinds of different uh, mappings of it if you look in different maps. It varies widely from individual to individual, but you have right sort of at the border between the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, Fernicke's area. This is important for speech recognition and also reading comprehension as well. But we think of this as speech recognition area. And then we also have another important area for language. And notice this is only on the left-hand side in most individuals. And then we also have in the supplemental motor area, which is all the stuff in front of the motor cortex, we have this area right here. And notice how it's right next to the temporal lobe. This is Broca's motor speech area. And this area is responsible for planning movements for speaking so that you can actually say intelligible words and put sounds together. You are actually planning the motor movements to make the sounds that you would speaking that make sense. You've already touched on some of the additional areas, such as the premotor cortex. Let's go down to the mid-sagittal view and the ventral view. And the mid-sagittal view, we have the thalamus, Corpus callosum. Here's the thalamus, and there are two halves of the thalamus. This is one half of the thalamus. Here's the other half over here. It is this orange bulge right here. And you'll see, uh, I'll bring your attention to 47 here, which is the interthalamic adhesion. And this is important because you see all this space around the thalamus. If you put the two halves together, that very thin space is going to be our third ventricle. So the corpus callosum is this large white matter tract right here and it actually connects the two hemispheres so they can communicate to one another. So if you were to look down the longitudinal fissure and look inside in an intact brain, the corpus callosum would transverse that from one hemisphere to the other, and it makes a uh, means of communication between the two hemispheres. It's a very large white matter tract right here. And then we have the uh, fornix and the septum pellucidum. The fornix is this part right here and this is going to be connecting limbic areas to other uh, limbic areas like hippocampus to mammillary bodies. We'll get into that a little bit later in lecture, but that's this number 45 right here. It's right above the thalamus. The septum pellucidum, once again, is a thin layer that separates the lateral ventricles. That would be 44 on this model. And if you want to see what a lateral ventricle is, it's the space, those fluid-filled spaces in the brain. So here, if we were to remove the septum pellucidum, you could Put your finger back there you could actually see uh, a big space in there and there's one on either side and these are the lateral ventricles okay so we've covered the lateral ventricles and we covered the third ventricles between the two thalami and then we need to locate the fourth ventricle which is right here and if you were looking through the brain it would be kind of a kite shape but it is between the cerebellum and the pons and the medulla oblongata. So here's the pons and the medulla oblongata. Here's your fourth ventricle and here's your cerebellum. And you have this little thing here called the cerebral aqueduct that leads from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And then that's eventually going to lead to what will become the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay, and we, our next items, you've mentioned the pons, the medulla oblongata, and the spinal cord, which is not 
officially present on this model. Yeah, might get away with saying this bottom part right here is the beginning of the spinal cord. The very tippy bottom. So this is the pons. They've cross-hatched it here. The medulla oblongata is this part below it from here to, say, the end of the cerebellum here. This is the medulla oblongata. And if you look at it and you turn it, you see that this is the pons. You can see it in the lateral view as well. It's the big bulge with the transverse fibers. And in the sagittal view, they've cross-hatched it, so it makes it very easy to recognize. Okay, that takes us to the ventral view of... Wait, what about the cerebellum? Did we not forget the arbor vitae? Is that on there? Might be. I don't know. But all this squiggly stuff in here, this is the arbor vitae. And of course, everything on the outside, they haven't colored it differently, but all this stuff on the outside would be the gray matter. All this stuff inside is the arbor vitae. I think it's worth mentioning. Yes, we looked at that on the, in the sheep, sheep model. Brain. It is, uh, the coloration uh, is very distinct in the sheep brain. Right. The ventral view of the model, we will start with the optic nerve and the optic chiasm. So the optic nerve is right here. You see this Roman numeral two? This stands for cranial nerve two, which is the optic nerve. Where it comes together, there's one on either side, and you can imagine this would continue on out, and there would be an eyeball up here. And this comes in, you just see a very small portion, right from about here to here, of the optic nerve before it joins the optic chiasm, which is a crossing. So you've got the crossing of the two optic nerves where they come together. And so this part where my finger is, is the optic chiasm. I believe if we look the sagittal view, there is a markation in an, of the optic chiasm. 53. Number 53 is the optic chiasm. Mm -hmm. And then if we look, turn the sagittal view, we can see the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland. This is 115. And since this is a model that they brought into two pieces, they had to stick it all on one side. So this is the pituitary gland, and it's hanging right below or right underneath the optic chiasm. If you were to look at it in sagittal view, you'd see the optic chiasm and the pituitary gland right below it. Yes, and the infundibulum that connects the pituitary gland is not visible on this model. It's more or less this part here. All of this is hypothalamus. This orange part that's below the thalamus. So this is hypothalamus, but the infundibulum literally means funnel, and it's the stalk. It'd be the very tippy end of this thing, really. Yes. Where, and they haven't delineated it on the model. Yes, it would probably be fragile and, and break. Uh, then we also need to look at the olfactory bulb and olfactory tract on the ventral side of the model. So this is the olfactory bulb. There's one on either side, and the Olfactory nerve comes up through it, through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, if you remember. And so the olfactory nerves are going to come perforate through there, or through that perforated cribriform plate, and make contact with the olfactory bulbs. And then that information is going to be relayed back to the brain via the olfactory tract. Okay, and then we mentioned the infundibulum and the pituitary gland, which I can see closely from this view. I can see uh, the olfactory bulb and the tract labeled one, Roman numeral one, that's not a capital I, and then below it, the optic nerve with the Roman numeral two uh, pro pro uh, proceeding out on each side laterally and the pituitary gland numbered 115 uh, below that. The pons and medulla oblongata and the spinal cord, cord we have already covered on the ventral surface, as we see. And that has taken us through all of the structures that we are to find on the brain model. I'm going to double check my list to make sure that I have covered everything. Oh, we didn't talk about the uh, superior and inferior colliculi, which are here. Uh, here's the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. And this is the, what's called the roof or the tectum of the midbrain, which would be this part right here. But you can clearly see superior and inferior colliculus. I don't know if that's on this sheet or not. That is on the sheep brain and not on the model. Okay. The uh, 
premotor cortex, I thought we had gone over, and I had thought that was on the list as yep. well as the yes, the premotor area and the somatic sensory association area. Right. So the premotor area is going to be in front of or anterior to the primary motor cortex. This is where movement planning occurs. Also, um, supplementing motor area sometimes called that, but this is premotor. It's all yellow in here. And then our um, sensory association areas and interpretation is going to be a lot of the parietal lobe here, this lavender stuff that's right behind the purple primary sensory cortex. So primary sensory cortex, posterior to that, you have the uh, sensory association areas. Okay, this has taken us through all of the structures and features to be identified on the brain model for the lab.